I'm Anisha Tank. You're watching the Global Common Channel for the fin Singapore FinTech Festival 2020. Now, Sark and ASEAN emerging economic epicenters and SME powerhouses in the making? That's the question. There could be two billion opportunities out there. That is the subject of the next session. We have a highly energizing panel. They're probably energized too. They'll discuss the changing world order and the emergence of the SARC and ASEAN sub-regions as economic powers. So here to moderate the panel is Andrew Work, director of the Lion Rock Institute, and joining him, Cesar Purissima, who is Asia Fellow at the Milken Institute, Futi Xia, who is Assistant Chief Executive of Infocom Media Development Authority, Salim Hussain, Chief Executive Officer at Bangladesh's BRAC Bank, and Anupam Verma, who is the Chief Executive of Singapore and Regional Head for Southeast Asia at ICICI Bank. We'll go now to Andrew and his panel for the discussion around opportunities for SARC and ASEAN. And hello, and welcome to the SARC and ASEAN Emerging Economic Entrepreneurs at SME, SME Powerhouses. Two billion opportunities in the making, whether you just logged in or whether you've been watching all day long on behalf of the Singapore FinTech Festival, I'd like to welcome you to our session uh, and tell you that we're in for a really big one. So strap yourselves in and get ready to go. I've got four big panelists that I want to introduce to you now. Uh, and I'm going to run through the introductions, and then we're going to give them a chance to bring you their introductory remarks. So uh, I'm going to give the home court advantage to the first person I'd like to introduce, and that is Fu Chi Xia, who is the Assistant Chief Executive with the Infocom Media Development Authority of Singapore. And what is that all about? They're making deep investments in digital infrastructure, innovation, and inclusion. So they want to do that through building stronger global collaboration uh, and norms around the world. And she is the right person for the job because she's a career diplomat who, previous to this job, was Singapore's high commissioner to the UK, based in London, also ambassador to Ireland and uh, Iceland at the same time. Uh, so clearly at the top of Singapore's diplomatic corps and really the right person to do this. So uh, really, really exciting stuff. She is going to be joined in today's panel by Cesar Purisima. He is an Asia fellow with the Milken Institute. Uh, and I founded a think tank, and I tell you, when people in think tanks talk about think tanks, the Milken Institute is recognized as one of the top of the world. He's also created a pan-Asian private equity path, and he sits on the board of like anybody and anything that matters, whether it's in the NGO sector, like the World Wildlife Fund of the Philippines, in education, like Bill LaSalle University and the International School of Manila, but also a great Philippine brand names that everybody knows and loves, like Jolly Bee Foods, uh, Ayala Land, and then some global outfits, uh, including the AIA Group. Now, it's probably only fitting because that he that he has this level because he was the Secretary of Finance in the Philippines under President Benino Aquino the third. And so, really, uh, a great person to have on this panel to discuss this topic today. Uh, we've also got from the banking sector. We've got Anupam Verma. He's the Chief Executive for Singapore. Uh, and he's also the regional head for Southeast Asia for ICI, uh, ICICI Bank, uh, of which, of course, is out of India. And he's a lifer. He joined them in 1999 as a management graduate uh, from the famous IIIE out of India. Um, and he moved from corporate banking to become what we call a client banker, which is quite special. And it means that he was responsible for coverage and delivering solutions across commercial banking, treasury, investment banking products. I mean, most people, they just focus on the sector, but he's focused on the client. Uh, but he also does some work in the community in Singapore as well, working with the Singapore Indian Development Association, and that gets him up close and personal, uh, even with uh, high school, secondary students, uh, and working as a mentor with young people, which I think is really great to see uh, people taking part and getting involved in the community. Uh, we also welcome today Salim Hussain, who's the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer from BRAC Bank. Uh, and he only joined them in two, 2015, but since then, he has taken them right to the top of their sector in Bangladesh. And they've become a real standard bearer for corporate governance and something called value-based banking. And they apply that across all the different companies that, that are part of their, their uh, the group across the, the broader enterprise. And they're in some really interesting stuff like mobile financial services. They've got a local software development company as part of their portfolio. They've got a UK company that is doing remittances, stock brokerage. I mean, 
it's really an interesting uh, collection of companies that they brought together. But at the heart of it is this concept of values based banking. And Salim's a convert to that cause. And I'm going to let him open up uh, our opening comments today. Salim, uh, welcome to the panel. Really excited to have you on. Value-based banking, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and also touch on our, our big topic of the day, SARC and ASEAN and SMEs. Take it away. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me on this program. Um, Values-based banking is essentially a focus on what we call on, on people, on the environment, the planet, and on prosperity for all our stakeholders. Uh, what that means is that for somebody like Bragg Bank, which is a publicly listed company, approximately 20 years old uh, bank, uh, while we have a strong focus on values for the shareholder, there is an equally strong focus on development goals as well. And that also stems from the fact that we are owned by 44% uh, of the bank is owned by the largest development organization in the world, uh, the NGO called BRAC. Um, but that's all about values-based banking. But what I'd like to focus on, Andrew, is uh, the SME sector in Bangladesh. You know, uh, when you talk about Bangladesh, most people think of Bangladesh as a, as a country with a very large population on a very small piece of land, which particularly in the 70s, 80s, and 90s suffered a uh, very significant climate, poverty, health, development-related challenges. And that's all very true. But over the last 15 or 20 years, things have changed quite dramatically. And Bangladesh has grown at 6% plus GDP growth rates for the last 15 years. They have achieved very significant success in terms of the millennium and the sustainable development goals. Um, and very importantly, the uh, CMSME sector, which is our pride and, and very much our DNA in Bragg Bank, that has emerged as a very important driver to this growth. And these organizations, these SME organizations, as we call them, ranging from micro merchants to agro processing to ready-made garments to manufacturing institutions, uh, um, organizations, these now comprise almost 30% of GDP, 90% plus of uh, civilian employment. Um, the CMSME sector is an absolutely key driver for the government's overarching goals of, of accelerating employment uh, and growth, reducing inequality and poverty. Uh, and we're very proud in Bragg Bank to have almost 53 to 54% as of today of all our customer assets in this particular sector, which I should also add is not exactly very popular with the general banking sector in Bangladesh, which tends to focus on the larger corporate and commercial businesses. Thanks very much, Andrew. Hey, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm impressed to hear those kind of stats. I remember talking to a banker in Hong Kong once and she wanted to reach out to talk about SMEs. I was, I was running a chamber of commerce. I said, what do you mean by SME? She goes, oh, well, at least $10 million. I'm like, Hong Kong dollars? She goes, oh, no, US dollars. I said, revenue? She goes, oh, no, profit. We mean at least $10 million US dollars profit a year. Like, we're really focused on small business. <laughs> I kind of lost my mind. Um, somebody who really understands this sector, understands trade, and of course, really had to think hard about SMEs when he was the Minister of Finance for the Philippines is Mr. Cesar uh, Purisima. Um, again, I'm so jealous of the Milken Institute. Maybe I'll get to do some work with them someday. But uh, Cesar, can you please uh, give us give us some of your thoughts? Thank you, uh, Andrew, and good, e good evening to my uh, fellow pan panelists and uh, uh, audience. I've been uh, locked down uh, at home for the past uh, uh, nine months. Uh, the Philippines have been one of the most uh, stringent uh, uh, social sequestration programs uh, since uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, the silver lining, though, of uh, the lockdowns is that uh, we've been all uh, forced to uh, become more digital. And that's what happened to the banking sector. I uh, spoke to a, a president of a bank in the Philippines and he said his estimate is uh, over five years work of uh, digitalization had to be a uh, fast track uh, for them to be able to service their uh, uh, customers uh, uh, properly. And that's the silver lining. It's not the CEO, CTO or CFO that's driven it. It's the uh, pandemic at an expensive cost to us, of course. Now, uh, if you look at the numbers, uh, for example, in the Philippines, ATM withdrawals has dropped 30%, check payments have dropped 70%. Our InstaPay, which is the central bank's electronic interbank transfer service, jumped 400%.
in the peso net uh, also of the central bank for inter uh, bank transfer service also increased by over 100 and 143 percent in uh, uh, volume. GCAS, which is the digital wallet of one of the telcos in the Philippines, has seen a thousand percent uh, uh, increase. And Union Bank, which is one of the traditional banks in the Philippines that is the leader in fintech, has seen user signups of over 2,000 uh, 700 percent increase year on year. So that has uh, that has shown you that. Uh, People have to adapt, and the banks also have to adapt if they want to keep their uh, customers. Now, how will this impact uh, SMEs in the Philippines? Before the pandemic, uh, the numbers, I think, is similar across uh, uh, ASEAN. In the Philippines, uh, they account for over 90% of entities. Uh, they account for two-thirds of the employment, over 67%. Uh, and they account for about 40% of GDP. But of credit they account for only 8% of credit. So there is a massive credit gap uh, when it comes to uh, uh, SMEs. And uh, I think uh, digitalization uh, can uh, help in addressing or uh, solving this credit gap. Um, first, by uh, uh, making it um, least, uh, lower cost uh, to service them, because one of the challenges is uh, the, 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 the transactions are smaller and the cost is uh, uh, higher. No? Uh, absence of uh, credit information and therefore alternative credit uh, uh, data using AI and uh, analysis of uh, uh, alternative uh, data sources uh, can provide uh, 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 additional uh, information pathways for banks to grant uh, uh, credit. Uh, there's also the opportunity to give them better access to uh, uh, information. For example, uh, an SME in Southern Philippines uh, before had a very small market, but with access to internet, access to e-commerce, suddenly the market is not just uh, uh, their small town, it becomes the whole Philippines and even a wider uh, uh, region. So uh, here, you know, I think it's a major opportunity to really uh, make a major leap in improving the economies of the region. A and wide uh, the uh, SMEs uh, account for over 50% of employment and about 40% of GDP. And if you run across the different ASEAN countries, it's a very similar uh, statistic. So therefore, uh, we really need to focus on digitalization to help SMEs and also accelerate ASEAN integration. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hear what you're saying. It sounds like uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and certainly it sounds like the Phil Business people in the Philippines have really uh, gone digital in a big way uh, using fintech. And I'm glad to hear that uh, fintech banks and, and Filipino fintech companies are there for them. I met the chairman of Union Bank at, at the Singapore Fintech Festival a couple of years ago, was blown away with the work they was doing. Really impressive. So from our friends in ASEAN, we're going to, uh, you know, I guess talk, we're going to look a little bit at SARC and hear from our, our other two speakers. Although, um, Anupam, you are you're from India, which is, is part of the SARC, but you're in Singapore. Uh, where you're running the ICI bank operations for Singapore and Southeast Asia. Uh, what's your take on, on what we're talking about here today? Yeah, hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. It's, it's, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, talking about the SMEs in India, uh, I believe this is the beginning of a golden decade. Uh, you know, India is likely to benefit from shifts in global supply chains, and we will also see more and more MNCs uh, setting up knowledge base in-house captives in India. On top of that, uh, you know, the domestic customers are getting used to e-commerce and the on-demand delivery, which will lead to more and more onshoring. So actually all this put together, uh, these are, uh, this is a great news for SMEs. Uh, however, for SMEs to ride this wave, uh, they will have to go on a path for their own digital transformation. Uh, you know, this would mean use of technology tools, ranging from creating an electronic record of their business, like digital payments uh, from customers or to suppliers, use of uh, software for accounting, tax reporting, payroll, and so on and so forth. Uh, on top of that, I think the, the transformation uh, would also entail creating a digital presence uh, uh, in terms of getting plugged into a B2B or a B2C online platform. And as a result, as a result have a hybrid model. Uh, all this put together will help SMEs remain competitive, expand their customer base, um, optimize cost, and get access to timely and cheaper finance. Uh, so what's happening in India right now is that industries and businesses are now operating within large ecosystems, 
and they are taking advantage of interconnected uh, um, you know set of services to fulfill customer needs example health education travel and hospitality and b2c marketplaces so smes will benefit immensely if they embed themselves into the into such ecosystems um as a as a ingredient uh, i think a key requirement for smes would be to have a digital identity uh, be it in terms of uh, ekyc goods and services tax return bank statement credit bureau data income tax return and their past behavior on the track record within their ecosystem be it let's say a large corporate like unilever or if they are with amazon or paytm uh, now combination of all these data sets is being used by banks to assess and disburse credit real time in a seamless and paperless manner so the implication of all this is very very positive for smes who were earlier unfunded or underfunded due to lack of collateral so going forward their digital identity and their digital footprint will act uh, in a big way as a collateral yeah and it's uh, great if they can get at, you know have that kind of identity online which has maybe been a barrier to getting credit in the past so uh, thank you very much for for bringing that in, and I'm sure we're going to come back to that topic because it is super interesting, and uh, we're going to try to squeeze it into the 40 minutes that we have. Uh, we'd like to hear from Ms. Fuchi Xia. This, I feel, you know, as a former uh, High Commissioner to to the UK, I, I'm wondering, is there another title should I should be using? I should be Your Excellency or uh, something along those lines? Yeah, we, we're just going to get your microphone live, uh, and that'll make it a little easier for us to hear you. That'd be great. Um, but you were also ambassador to Ireland and Iceland, so I guess I can call you Ambassador Fu, because I know people hold that title for life. So yeah. Well, well, we don't hold a title for life, so Chisa would be perfect. <laughs> um, and um, thank you so much, Andrew, and uh, my fellow panelists, and good evening to everyone who is tuning in from Singapore, um, but of course, um, as Anupad mentioned, it could be good morning and good afternoon to um, people from all over the world. Um, can, now that I'm with IMDA, which is really the agency responsible um, for, in some ways, architecting uh, Singapore's digital future, uh, we play both a regulatory role uh, as well as a development role in the digitalization space. And um, what I thought I would share this evening is really um, what we have been doing in Singapore um, in the digitalization of SMEs, the kind of support we have been giving, um, and then move on a little bit to what we do within Southeast Asia, the 10 economies uh, of Southeast Asia that Cesar has already mentioned a little bit. Um, and then maybe from there, talk really about what we are hoping to do in terms of um, some global initiatives and platforms that we are providing. Um, so starting with Singapore, I think people might be surprised um, to know that um, we actually have 99% of our enterprises are SMEs. Um, they provide two thirds of our employment um, and about 50% of our GDP. Um, so in many ways, if you look at the shape of our economy, it's almost like a, a thumbtack. Uh, which means a very broad base that provides a significant amount of employment and, and a, a decent amount of um, GDP as well, uh, and a very small percentage of large local enterprises or multinational companies that provide the rest, um, which means that as a very globally connected city-state, um, the reality is that we have compressed what is otherwise uh, in much larger countries uh, an a ecosystem um, that necessitates that in order for Singapore to remain uh, competitive, to increase our productivity, the SME sector is what we really need to invest very significantly on. Um, and IMDA, way before the pandemic, um, has put in significant programs to help our SME go digital. So we literally call it SME Go Digital that was launched a couple of years ago. Um, what it does is to provide a whole suite of pre-curated, market-proven, uh, reliable um, kind of digital resources from very basic foundational ones of human resource management, payroll, um, to getting um, access to um, cybersecurity, which is of course very important, yeah. um, and offering that with a certain amount of grants in order to encourage a higher adoption of digital uh, solutions. Um, that's the very basic level that we provide, but we also have different tiers. 
um, given the size of Singapore's economy, clearly most companies in order to be competitive need to go global. So we have um, the scheme where SMEs uh, grow with SMEs, go, go global. Um, and then we offer a, a much higher suite uh, of digital solutions in, in a similar format, um, but kind of categorized according to your industry sector, um, somewhat more curated um, based on the level of um, your development and the ability to reach out to a broader international market, whether it's B2C or B2B, uh, without necessarily having a physical presence uh, around the world. And, um, and we, we have also a national e-invoicing um, scheme uh, where we adopt a, actually a pan-European standards called PayPal Authority. And how we drive adoption, apart from the grants that we've been giving, um, is to use the government procurement, really, um, to, to require e-invoicing as a result that, of that as a very large market from the government. Uh, companies then adopt the e-invoicing. And when I get to what we are doing regionally and globally, uh, we will fit that picture together of what we are doing uh, in Singapore. So now that we have been hit by COVID, um, we have a, a fortunate of a significant base of SMEs who are already digitalized. Um, but we all also know that in a, a pandemic, a pandemic recovery phase, what we see is really a, a K-shaped recovery. Those who are digitalized um, actually do a lot better. Um, and those who are not actually do much worse. And so you have an unfortunate key of a greater divergence um, between the digital and non-digital. And I think what we are now trying to do is really to uh, smoothen the key, kind of make it perhaps a little closer to a C. Um, and and you know, the, the immediate response of the government is to provide um, a, a huge relief um, support measure, which is about 20% of our GDP, and clearly that has to be very targeted, not just to individuals who have been most affected, but significant companies that are most affected, uh, which means these are the companies that have very high touch. Um, and, um, and, and, and we also need to transform the economy in creating the skills um, for our companies and our workers to be able to uh, further digitalize in the post-pandemic recovery phase. And in and I would then mention kind of two sectors which perhaps might be interesting. Um, those of you who have visited Singapore or live in Singapore would know that one of our greatest pride and joy is the Singapore hawker food. Uh, we have a lot of a kind of street food uh, hawkers all across Singapore. And this is the sector, of course, that was most affected. It's all about congregating lots of people, sharing your food, having great conversations. Uh, and in what would be called the lockdown period for the rest of the world, what we call circuit breaker, um, clearly the hawkers have been most affected. Um, and what we then tried to do is to use this opportunity um, to provide hawkers go digital, um, a system where they could um, you know, use kind of contactless system and e-payment. Uh, we created a solution, which is a unified QR code um, that can a a a accept e-payments from different, different, uh, 19 different um, e-payment systems. Um, you know, consumers could just use uh, a QR code to, 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 to make payment. Um, and again, support schemes are given to, to the hawkers in order to convert to the e-payment system. On the other side, it's really about seniors. And I think that's the huge challenge when we all go digital, we can communicate on video conference, do your, your phone calls and others. Um, but the older people who tend to want to, to spend their time together found it challenging. Um, so we then have a Seniors Go Digital program um, that help them use these communication skills, but more importantly, to be able to use many of the digital solutions, whether government services uh, or e-payment system, digital banking, uh, such that they are not excluded um, from this drive as well. Um, so those are, I think, two very important um, um, policies that we put in place in order to bring um, greater inclusion for, for our society. Um, so moving on to what we are doing in, uh, from Singapore to ASEAN. Um, similarly, I think this is something that we have been paying a lot of attention to given um, the potential of ASEAN. Um, there's a report um, that suggested that we will triple our um, digital economy in the next five years, which of course represents a very strong trajectory. Yeah. Um, but really, um, that really comes from a very low base of untapped potential. Uh, the ASEAN only has about, um, you know, kind of 7% of the GDP um, that is digital, 
well, if you compare to it, that to China, it's about 16%. In Europe, it's about 27%. In the US, it's 35%. Um, so the reason why ASEAN is able to grow so fast is because we are really starting from a very low base. And um, what we really need to do is to help more ASEAN companies on board and to digital platforms. And once you kind of cross border, what you really need to do is to have the harmonization uh, of the rules and regulations so that companies, uh, especially small and medium enterprises, have the ability to onboard these digital solutions across borders quite easily. Um, and that's when, when I talk about the uh, invoicing system that we have adopted, we are hoping that the rest of ASEAN and some of our like-minded partners like Australia and New Zealand uh, would use a similar platform. So, so once the SMB adopts that platform, you could instantly use it um, in, in, the, in the country that you're likely to be, to be uh, trading with. Um, so we have done quite a lot of harmonization work um, in ASEAN. We hope to be able to do more work in terms of data privacy and others, because at the end of the day, you really need to be able to transfer data as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, well, so that's ASEAN, but let me just finish with some uh, kind of global work that we are doing that ideally, of course, you want it to be, to be done through the WTO, um, through some of the work we are doing. We are also doing it with like-minded partners. Um, but what we have also provided are two platforms, um, a platform that has just been launched at the Singapore FinTech Festival um, called Prextora, which is really a platform a platform to connect SMEs across the world. Um, and the second is what we call Trade Trust, uh, which allows for digitalization of documents and allow for SMEs to, to better assess um, some of these uh, digital solutions again. So I will stop there, and I think you, you would like to get into Q&A uh, for us to get into greater depth in some of these issues that I've raised. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of moving parts there to, to, uh, to, to check in with. And we, we are getting questions from the audience. I've got it here, and I'm going to come to some of those lately. I've got some names here. Um, and so people, do, don't worry. We will get to your questions if you're watching this from home or your office or wherever. Um, but, you know, you talked about a lot of different programs that Singapore is doing. The one thing that really caught my ear was, like, you tell people, uh, businesses in Singapore, if you want to do business with us, you got to be on the platform. You know, we're, we're not sending you money unless you go digital. It's like, woof. That's, uh, you know, that's some, that's some tough love, but I'm sure it moves a lot of people across the line. Um, I'm kind of interested to hear what the banks are doing to help their customers to come in, because Salim talked about this. Uh, you know, Anupam, I'm sure you guys are doing something, but this is really tough, especially for small businesses, old businesses, especially, you know, with all due respect, if they're run by older people, it can be really hard to get them uh, across the line uh, in, in different places. And I wonder if Salim or, or Anupam, have you, got, have, you guys, have you guys been working in this area to help, to help bring these companies across the line? Yes, thanks. Um, um, Andrew, I, I have to say even in Bangladesh, which is a country which is just about to graduate from an LDC status to a more of a developing st uh, country status, um, you see, what has changed is that customer behavior has been changed by this pandemic. That is the one positive outcome. The fact that, as Mr. Cesar mentioned earlier, that three to five years worth of uh, acceleration in terms of the digitalization agenda across an economy has now been compressed into a very short period of time. The customer behavior has changed. They want different things in a different way. At least the channel has changed completely. And you, as a as a supplier, as a business, if you are not able to respond to that change, whether you're a financial institution or you're a retailer or you're a hawker on the street, uh, you're not going to survive. So, um, the, and very interestingly, we found that even demographics, 15% um, of BRAC banks' customer deposits are from what we call senior citizens. Mm -hmm. yeah. and Six times more senior citizens are now being onboarded uh, in the last four or five months onto online solutions than was the case in 2019. So that change is not necessarily restricted to under 30s or under 40s. Um, it's happening across demographics. Uh, mm -hmm. And it is happening to uh, people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who incidentally are very important customers for banks such as ours. Uh, so 
it is absolutely incumbent upon institutions, organizations, banks, particularly the sector I come from, to immediately respond. If you haven't started earlier, you need to get into a digitalization journey. You need to plan out what you want to do and need to be able to do in a couple of years time. And you better start investing quickly because I, I do believe that even in countries like Bangladesh, in two to three years time, many institutions, certainly financial institutions will die if they are not able to adapt to this change. Um, finding ways to broaden, deepen access for customers to, to uh, either deposit products or credit products, uh, new geographies, new customer segments. If you are not able to do that and at a very um, effective, efficient price, then your institution is not going to survive very long. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, really interesting what you're saying about the, the older demographic getting online. Because if you serve that demographic, it's all been about, you know, creating, still having to have physical spaces for them, designed for them. But now if they're going online, you know, it might finally push those SMEs to follow them. Uh, Anupam, I know you guys at ICICI, yeah. I expect you've been doing some work in this sector to help SMEs get online. What's the, so what's the story there? Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, let me give a couple of examples on how banks uh, as well as uh, government is working together, including our bank. Uh, so if you look at uh, today in India, a startup can open an account instantaneously at the time of incorporation. For example, ICICI Bank has integrated its API with the Ministry of Corporate Affairs portal. So the importance of ease of onboarding a new business or a startup is clearly drive, uh, driving these integrations. And now a startup can uh, be, be open for business from day one. You know, the goods and services uh, tax network in India is another enabler, which provides the granular insights into the functioning of SME. And now it's a key real-time input in the credit underwriting for banks. And same goes for individual and commercial credit bureau data and all these data sets are integrated via API to make the underwriting process real time, seamless and, and, and paperless. In fact, um, in India, one will soon have an architecture where the SME can use account aggregators, which will have, who will have access to all the business data, bank statements and GST return. And with the SME's consent, all that data shared can be shared with lenders to make a real time credit assessment and disbursement of loan can be done in a matter of seconds. This will democratize SME credit as they will be able to choose the best offer. And, you know, uh, uh, you know we will also be there as one of the uh, banks, uh, you know, on that platform. Sure. Uh, on top of that, uh, I think, uh, you know, government and private uh, sector partnerships can also play a big role in providing business support infrastructure mm -hmm. for technology adoption. For example, ICSA Bank has a SME platform called BizCircle, which has more than 100,000 connections and it is used by our SME clients for all their needs beyond banking. It could be finding partners, new vendors, IT support services, networking, knowledge sharing, and scaling. And last uh, but not the least, I think, you know, Proxtera is a, is a, uh, in Singapore is a great example in that direction. Uh, Proxtera will act as a connector of platforms from different countries. And this can be a game changer for SMEs as this will give them access to cross-border e-commerce and open up new markets. I think when, SMEs look at going beyond the shores, trust becomes very, very important. And Proxera can play a crucial role in building this trust uh, through technology across counterparties. Okay, I mean, that you know, these are great programs and they're working, but I mean, uh, maybe Cesar, I got a question here that comes from one of our, our people and, and they wanna know like, how can that work? It, it, these are all great in-country uh, projects, but you know, you were a minister of trade and then you were a minister of finance for a long time. And I guess, you know, you really had to think about building the international connections um, so that SMEs could work together across borders. Uh, you talked about the innovation that's been driven in the Philippines, but I mean, once you've kind of crossed that line, how do you then, uh, you know, what, what can be done at the supranational level? Countries working together. And I mean, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you have a couple of words because I know Chisia is also thinking about that every day. But Cesar, why don't you why don't you kick us off on that? Well, first, the the, the sad uh, situation right now is that the COVID pandemic has really hit the bottom of the pyramid, and uh, the bottom of the pyramid is mainly the SMEs, especially in the service uh, uh, sector. Uh, they have very limited uh, uh, capital, uh, very limited liquidity, uh, very little uh, uh, assets. 
Uh, and therefore, the trust uh, of uh, government intervention really is to uh, keep them uh, above uh, water. No? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the monetary authorities have been uh, flooding uh, the capital markets with liquidity. But unfortunately, the target of that liquidity is the one that's not getting it because their credit quality has deteriorated as a result of uh, the economic uh, uh, situation. In fact, in the Philippines uh, now, uh, the central bank has uh, told banks that uh, lending to SMEs will become part of your reserve, uh, uh, you know, compliance with reserve requirement. In fact, there's a law that uh, requires a certain percentage of uh, borrowings or lending uh, to uh, SMEs. No? And therefore, uh, digitalization uh, cannot really uh, uh, meet its uh, uh, potential unless uh, you have a more holistic approach to the uh, situation. In the case of Philippines, and I guess similar countries uh, situated like the Philippines, we have four key challenges. So, uh, one is connectivity. Uh, two is uh, limited adoption of digital payments. Uh, three is uh, expensive and prohibitive uh, logistics. And uh, four, the overall business environment. Uh, in the case of the Philippines, about 33% still do not have access to internet. In this day and age, uh, I think uh, uh, access to the internet must be uh, looked at as a human right, as uh, similar to electricity and access to uh, uh, potable uh, water. No? And uh, I think it is uh, uh, incumbent upon countries to really uh, work with the private sector to improve uh, access to that. Not just access, but uh, 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 better quality access and lower cost uh, access. Unfortunately for us in the Philippines, among the ASEAN six countries, uh, based on uh, various uh, indices, uh, we are unfortunately the lowest. No? Uh, because, uh, for example, when it comes to infrastructure, uh, our tower uh, uh, penetration is uh, much lower uh, than our neighboring countries. Our ratio right now is one, to one tower to almost 5,000 users, whereas uh, in Vietnam, which is, uh, uh, you know, started later than us, they have one to 711. So it has to be a more holistic solution. And digital payments, uh, you know, we should follow, for example, the lead that India did, which required uh, digital IDs. Now, we don't, still don't have uh, uh, universal adoption of digital uh, IDs. And I can go on and on about the problems with digital uh, uh, payments. Logistics cost is also uh, uh, quite high, a combination of regulations as well as uh, infrastructure uh, uh, issue. And then in the business environment uh, area, it's uh, you know, a complex uh, uh, problem of uh, government still uh, uh, doing things manually, uh, ease of doing business, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, if we really want to uh, make sure that uh, digitalization can achieve its potential of empowering uh, uh, SMEs, we must uh, deal with those four key challenges. And if I move, uh, you know, take a broader uh, picture on ASEAN, uh, there are many things that we still need to do. Uh, one is harmonization. We need to harmonize standards, harmonize rules. Uh, we need to connect uh, our, uh, our system so that it's easy uh, to move uh, products from the Philippines to another country. Uh, national single window system uh, is still not universally Im implemented across, across uh, ASEAN. Imagine if we can, you know, uh, start with that, then uh, with great. one input, it, it's automatically recognized in the rest of uh, ASEAN. But clearly, uh, digitalization is the way to go if we yeah. want to help SMEs, uh, uh, you know, out of this pandemic. Okay. Well, I do want to recognize we, we had more questions coming in about uh, EKYC about and digital identity helping to get access to credit and about how supply chain disruption has given new opportunities to the region. But we are out of time. Uh, so I think we're going to have to take a lot of these big issues that we identified in this discussion and we're going to have to bring it to Singapore FinTech Festival 2021. When I think, Tisha, you're going to welcome, you're going to invite us all to Singapore. My physically wife. as well. It's, yeah. Hopefully you can all come physically to Singapore. Absolutely. <laughs> I've, I've been to fin, I've been to the Singapore FinTech Festival a couple of times. It's absolutely one of the best events on the planet. I'm really honored to have been invited to moderate this session. A big thank you once again to Ms. Uh, Fu Chi Xia, Assistant Chief Executive of the Infocom Media Development Authority in Singapore. Cesar Purissima, the Asian Fellow for the Milken Institute. Anupam Verma, Chief Executive Singapore and Regional Head of Southeast Asia, ICICI Bank. And Mr. Salim Hussain, the CEO of BRAC Bank. And we're out of time. Thank you very much. Singapore FinTech Festival 2020. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
Bye. Bye. Thank you. Andrew, phenomenal timing. Thank you so much for that. What a great panel, so energized, I told you, right? But we'll definitely have more to look out for from the SARC and ASEAN regions as the world economic powers continue to shift in order to find some balance.